Well, it truly is the perfect last verse for amazing things. Thank you very much. You know, um, as a young boy, uh, I love Superman. Um, I love every comic book. I watch every episode of the TV show. And I love how mild man Clark Kent would go into that phone booth and come out as Superman, who was faster than a speed bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, and able to leap tall buildings with a single bat, who fought a never-ending fight for truth, justice, in the American way. Today, in our government, I don't think we need people who think they are either a superman or a super woman. We just need ordinary men and women who are willing to fight the never-ending fight for truth, justice, in the American way. Doing it all in the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Please join with me in prayer. Lord, I thank you that the state of our nation is upon all of our hearts. It's heavy upon our, our hearts. And so what I ask myself and for others when it seems to be overwhelming that you would lift our eyes to you because you are our So I ask, come Holy Spirit, come. Come, speak to all of us now. Years ago, there was a movie out that you might have seen that starred uh, Sean Connery, and it was called The Man Who Would Be King. Well, 2,500 years or so ago, Saul was the man who really didn't want to be king and would be the king, the kind of king that God wanted him to be in the kind of king that Israel needed. But he sure looked the part. He was the most handsome man in all of Israel, and he was like a head taller than anybody else. But the scriptures let us know that evidently in his own eyes, he was small and insignificant. Because when Samuel told Saul that God had chosen him to be king, in effect, this is what Saul replied. I can't be king because I am of the poorest family and the smallest tribe in Israel. And then later, when Samuel came to anoint him as king, Saul was hiding out, hoping that no one would find where he was. But God gave Saul everything he needed to be king. Numerous times the Holy Spirit was poured out on Saul and changed his heart. And Saul started out well. He had a, a victory or two over the enemy, but it wasn't long until Saul falls. Because he wanted what he wanted. He wanted to do it his way and not God's way. So he often took matters into his own hands openly disobeying God. And get this, after a, a, a victory where they defeated the enemy, instead of giving God the glory, Saul went and in his pride erected a monument uh, to himself. And then Saul continues to turn his back on God. And finally, God reaches a point where he has had enough and he says that he is that he had made Saul king. Saying, Saul has turned away from me and not kept my instruction. And so that God selects David to be king. Because David is a man after God's own heart who wants what God wants, who uh, does what is good for the people, who gives God the glory and keeps God's commands. And at this point in the story, um, the Bible implies that these two 
things simultaneously happen. Samuel came and anointed David to be king someday. And the Holy Spirit was poured out on him and would remain continually and powerfully on David. And at that same moment, seemingly, the Holy Spirit left Saul and was replaced by an evil spirit that tormented him for the rest of his life. And after that, we see Saul making more and more bad, selfish, even murderous choices, constantly abusing his authority and power, doing whatever it takes to stay in office. Each one of those things that he does, it's another step closer to madness for Saul. I'll tell you, what a contrast between those two people, David and Saul. Saul, whose people were absolutely terrified because of what he might do to them. And David, who cares for him, watches over the people in his men wanting only what was good to them. And how differently Israel fared under those two different leaders. And if you will, that first Samuel and the first and second Samuel it is almost a tale of two different leaders. Two kings who are so different. And if you hadn't lived in Israel back then, who would you want to have as a king. Yeah. Me too. Me too. There's an old movie that is worth watching today, especially today. And it's called Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And it stars uh, Jimmy Stewart as a man by the name of Jefferson Smith. Uh, in the movie, um, a senator dies. And so, literally, on the flip of a coin, a naive and honest Smith who uh, is over something like the Boy Scouts gets selected by the governor to go and be a senator. Now, after Smith proposes a bill to buy some land to make a national boys' camp, um, Smith fought, finds himself fighting against Washington's political, corrupt political machine. Because they have made a deal under the table for that same land that would make him wealthy. And so a senator who was part of that ball uh, starts a smear campaign against them and ruins his good name and reputation. But in a 25 hour long filibuster in the Senate, Smith tries to prove that he's innocent. And he eventually does when that same corrupt sen senator repents, comes forward, confesses his sins of wrath in the illegal land. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Don't you wish he was here there right now? That's the kind of people that we need in Congress. Now, at the, start, at the start of each new Congress, in January of every odd number of years, the entire House of Representatives, as well as one-third of the Senators, take this oath. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office of, on which I am about to enter. So help me. And so all of those becomes they are swearing, not this oath, not just to each other. They're swearing this oath, not just to us, the American people, but they are swearing this oath to Almighty God. And I don't know about you, but right now, 
there doesn't seem to be many in Washington who are doing the things that they have sworn to do. They are not using the power and authority that God has given them for the good of the people. Instead, it seems like they are in government for what they can get out of it. And so they are missing by a mile doing what JFK exhorted us to do all those years ago. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. We started out, I started out this year talking about Romans 13. And in verses 3 and 4, uh, those verses say this, that the government is God's servant to do good to the people. In our government today, this is from my perspective, I think fewer and fewer people see themselves as public servants. In fact, I think instead of public servants, they are just the exact opposite. We have a lot of Saul's in office right now who are in it for themselves, people who play fast and loose for the truth, leaders who have thrown civility and decency out the window, who don't seem to care about what the people want to do. So what do we do? We know, right? We pray for them. Okay. We pray that where they need to, that they will have a change of heart, that they will repent. And if they don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, then they will come into a relationship. But I think, after a while, if that doesn't happen, then we ask the Lord to take him out of office. Because I believe that God is raising up female and male Davids to lead us, men and women of God who will work and fight for what is true and right. For we have a God who wants justice to thunder down like a waterfall and for righteousness to flow like a mighty river that never runs dry. A God who wants us to know and to live out His truth because it is truth that sets us free and it's sin that takes our freedom away. Okay, I know everybody in this room is thinking, he's talking about politics right now in the church. But I tell you, politics have been in the church and in everywhere else for a long time. And it, in politics, have affected the church in so many ways. This is what this author says, and see if you don't agree. It is politics that have cost Christian bakers their business. It's politics against believers at Silicon Valley fire. It's politics that can get one of your students expelled from school. It's politics that's why men in sexy women clothes are reading to children in libraries. It's politics are why you and I are accused of hate speech when it's simply the normal language of the church that we are using. Politics is why our tax dollars, excuse me, tax dollars fund the Holocaust of abortion. And not only has God used the church in the past in government, many believe that it is our role to be active in the government. Charles Finney writes this. He was a leader of the Second Great Awakening in America. No man can possibly be benevolent or religious to the full extent of his obligation without concerning himself to a greater or lesser extent with the affairs of the human government. And guess who he holds responsible? for the sorry state of affairs that our nation is in now. Ready? If there is a decay of conscience, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the public press lacks moral discernment, 
The pulpit is responsible for it. If the church is degenerate and worldly, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the world loses its interest in Christianity, the pulpit is responsible for it. If Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. If our politics, this was written over a hundred years ago, almost 150 years ago, if, if our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. And I don't mean to be dramatic, but I want you to know, as I was studying this week, and I read, I read these words, I fell to my knees and I wept, and I asked God to forgive me for my part in that. And so now, my precious brothers and sisters, I ask for your forgiveness for all the things I have said or done that I knew I should do. William Wilberforce almost single-handedly brought down slavery in England. Now, and on his deathbed, while the battle was still ran hot over this issue, John Wesley wrote this note to Wilberforce. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them together stronger than God? Uh, be not weary of well-doing. Go on in the name of God and in the power of His might. I believe we are in the greatest battle ever for the heart and soul of our nation. For what our nation will be and will be like in the future. And we seem to be on the verge of becoming something the founding fathers never wanted us to be. We know where the real battle is. Ephesians 6 tells us, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it is against the rulers and the authorities and the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And we know how we are to fight this fight. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says, The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they... Oh my gosh, I'm going to get out the thing. Uh, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought that make it obedient to Christ. I believe that God is raising up His people to fight this battle. I believe that John Wesley's words to William Wilberforce 200 years ago are now His words to you and to me. If God is for us, who can be against us? Are all of them together stronger than God? I say it again. If God is for us, who can be against us? Are all of them together stronger than God? And this time we, ask, we answer, if God is for us, who can be against us? No one. Are all of them together stronger than God? No, absolutely not. So we can go and fight the fight on our knees however Jesus shows us. And we go in the name of God and in the power of His might. Amen. Can you join with me? Thank you. I thank you for the hearts, the hearts of the men and women who are here today. Lord, I thank you that uh, they love you, Lord. They love you, they seek you, Lord Jesus. Uh, that you are first and foremost of them. And for many of them, I thank you for the 
faithfulness of the families. 150 years before a faithfulness to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. Our, thank you, God. We will be leading in Godliness. This is your precious name and prayer. Thank you. Our closing hymn will be the. <coughs> Living for Jesus. And we're going to do two verses, then the course, and we'll do the other two verses and the course.
I know this sitting forth will be a little bit different than what I normally do, but um, in Acts 5, the apostles are in the temple area and that they are preaching and teaching and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and about his resurrection. So of course the Jewish leaders don't like that. So they send guards to go and they arrest the apostles and they put them in jail for the night. At least part of the night. Because while in the middle of the night, an angel comes and there's a jailbreak and the, and the angel tells the apostles, go back first thing in the morning and preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And so in the morning, the Jewish leaders tell the guards to go and get the apostles. And of course, the guards go, and the jail doors are locked. The guards are in front of the jail doors, but there's no apostles. And so as this person comes back to tell that to the Jewish leaders, another person is coming to tell the Jewish leaders, I know where they are. They're in the temple courts. They're preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As I read that the other day, I pray for us. I pray for myself. Lord Jesus, give us that boldness. No matter what opposition we come against, give us boldness because that is what this world, what I need, that's what we need, and that's what this world desperately needs today. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.